Islam arrived in India within a century of its inception. In quite a substantial sense, Muslims set their foot on Indian soil before Muhammad bin Qasim arrived with his army from Arabia in 725 AD. The latter era was marked by invasions by kings and generals, casting a covetous eye on the riches and wealth of India. But more significantly, saints and men of learning came to the country in search of peace and spiritual tranquility. The famous saying of Prophet Muhammad speaks of a fresh whiff blowing from India. Thus, India was already known as a haven of knowledge and serenity in West Asia, Africa, and Arabian society at the dawn of the Islamic century. I think Muslims have been a part of India uh, for centuries. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe, and I think there's fact of history also, that 99% Muslims of India are of Indian origin. In the course of time, they got converted into Islam, and, uh, and therefore, while you have got Hindus in India, you have got Parsis, you have got uh, Sikhs, you have got uh, other uh, communities, and so also Muslims. Uh, and they, they form today about 12% of the uh, total population of India. In the long history of coexistence of Hindus, Muslims, and other compatriots, the Muslims of India faced their greatest trauma in the wake of the partition in 1947. It was their moment of truth when the country stood divided on the basis of the two-nation theory propounded by the Muslim League under the leadership of M. A. Jinnah. Both communities suffered physical and emotional hardships that took decades to heal. Hindus and Muslims, who had coexisted in perfect bonhomie through centuries, found themselves divided as separate nations. This was not all. The Muslims in India were left forlorn by their own co-religionists who went to Pakistan for greener pastures. Gandhiji and Nehru stood by them, and Maulana Azad kindled hope among them to stand up to the challenges facing them, however grave they were. There is nothing uh, for Indian Muslims except challenges, one challenge after another. It's a plethora of challenges. Now, what happened after the partition of the country, particularly from North India, Muslims who were educated and who were influential and who were to some extent affluent, most of them migrated to Pakistan, with the result that what was left here, people who had no traditions of education or competition, now they, they have to overcome that and they are gradually, gradually overcoming it. Maulana Azad's message of hope stands epitomized in his eloquent speech declaring, I am proud of being an Indian. I am part of the indivisible unity that is nationality. I am indispensable to this noble edifice and without me, this splendid structure of India is incomplete. I am an essential element which has gone to build India. I can never surrender this claim. Maulana Abul Kalam Azad was definitely a true great Indian patriot. He gave his entire life in the service of the nation. And he did say what he said was very right, that he is an indivisible part of this country. And I think every Indian Muslim is also has, will be an indivisible part of this country. The Indian Muslim contribution for the last 1,000 years has been immense. 
in every field they have contributed they have sacrificed they have lived and died here and i don't see any reason why we should not continue to be indivisible part of this country there is not in prior history and there will not in foreseeable history be another nation that has such a wonderful mix of religions and communities and languages and culture it would be like the height of folly and great sadness to to uh, hamper that or to damage that because it's it's like a one off it's never happened before it will never happen again uh, molana azad's uh, uh, spirit of remaining with india it only goes to show that whether he remained with india or had gone across the border what he really meant to say was this is one country one huge colossal uh, land of humanity of people with great tradition heritage and background which should not be separated molana azad's faith in hindu muslim unity was unshakable and he announced in his famous words even if an angel descends from heaven and tells me that india will be free but without the unity of hindus and muslims i will reject that freedom now he represented i think the grace and the dignity of our of our nation people like him people like nehru and gandhi you know in a strange way they were people of you know you you can fault them for policy you can fault them for we can't fault them for their integrity however even though left in a state of utter desolation by the leaders of the muslim league who had promised el dorado for all the muslims the indian leadership got itself busy in giving a secular direction to the post freedom polity to weave the nation into a comprehensive whole where all citizens irrespective of caste creed and community would be guaranteed equal rights this was the opportunity of indian muslims to play their positive role in nation building the muslims in india groped in the dark not knowing how to face the challenges facing them in the emerging ambience yet happily for them india stood steadfast by its secular and democratic commitment i always take history as an example of inspiration to me in my life and in history even as far back as 400 years akbar emperor akbar i he strikes me as a very brilliant personality and character because he infused the indian people into oneness and a national integration purpose came into existence even in those days and uh, his great sense of social justice which he gave to his people till today people remember the great achievements of the great emperor in fact uh, the moguls were the catalyst who brought the warring factions of the indian princes and maharajas together and akbar played a major part in this and the foundations of the communal harmony integration were virtually established in the time of the reign of akbar india became a secular state in sharp contrast to the theocratic newly created state of pakistan at the dawn of independence indian muslims had the advantage of guidance of stalwarts of india's national movement notable among them besides molana azad rafi ahmed kidwai and dr zakir hussain the latter rose to be the president of india the constitution of india is secular according to me once the constitution guarantees you a secular state then how can a film star or other guy or maybe abcd or me also can influence that i have not a single relative or no in in uh, who stays in pakistan why should my loyalties be with pakistan or for that is an india when we say it has to be with my own nation if at all and if that loyalty to my nation is taken away from me then i, I become what, what do i become where do i hang around am i hanging in a air i must belong to a nation so if by some uh, connivance on by some 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 feelings by some people would like me to believe that i am not a part of the nation this nation then i'm going to fight that out within me psychologically because i want to be a part of a nation as every individual wants to be a part of a nation 
So I think that there, there has been uh, this because of the division, unfortunate division, I would say, that uh, took place in the Indian subcontinent. We should never have taken place, according to me. And I think this uh, subcontinent would have been much more a beautiful place. Uh, but that, unfortunately, has taken. Uh, but no, the Indian Muslim, per se, I would say they are all, all, all Indian. This is called India. This, I, I, I believe this is called India. And I, I feel that, uh, as my request to our leaders, and uh, the, the heads of different uh, communities and different religion, that this is what is the rainbow. And this rainbow should not be destroyed because of their own self-interests and everything. Let India be like this. Let India grow together. Let Muslims and Hindus rub their shoulders with each other and bring a name for the country, as the cricketers have done it, as our great artists have done it. My wife was the first to get the international award for Mother India's performance in Carlo Berry. And she was a Muslim lady. But nobody called her a Muslim lady because they thought one Indian artist has won the award. India has a very substantial population of Muslims, more than Pakistan and Bangladesh, and only next to Indonesia. At the time of partition, even as the elite and educated Muslims in large numbers migrated to Pakistan, the bulk of those left behind in India were artisans or small landholders. They faced the problem of lack of modern education, while in services, the representation dipped low due to migrations to Pakistan. Both Hindus and Muslims were uprooted from their homelands in the wake of the partition riots, following mass exodus to and fro. The large mass of Muslims left in the lurch in the wake of the partition deserves a word of tribute for their steadfastness and determination to brave the odds. This speaks of their sense of patriotism and love for the motherland. Unorganized as they were as artisans and many of them losing their land holdings after the Zamindari abolition, they labored hard to carve a niche for themselves as breadwinners of the family. The innate atmosphere of liberalism and their general acceptability by their compatriots came as a boon to them. Hardships and prejudices notwithstanding, they made their living through their skills in brassware industry, glassworks, wood carving and other trades. The peasantry comprises the largest chunk of the Muslims spread over Indian villages, even in remote hamlets. There is little difference in their way of dressing and even eating habits. They are sons of the soil, deeply rooted in the Indian tradition. This large mass was ironically bypassed from voting at the time of partition because adult franchise was still a far cry in the dispensation of the British Raj. Educational institutions were sparse during those days. What the larger town would have was a middle school run by local authorities. The education was otherwise confined to madrasas and maktabs for the Muslims, as there were part shalas for the Hindus. You see, the basic thing any Muslim leader should demand for their flock is education. Education is such an essential commodity. It is, it is a commodity. It has value. An illiterate man cannot see anything. He is in a dark room. A literate ma man can see everything because the light is on. So the education factor must come in first. I agree when you say that the Muslims or young Muslim guys should have the right education. But I differ with you on the count that Madrasa education is not good enough. It provides them with sound moral edifice for life. After that, it's up to the student concern how they build on that. Because after all, nowadays we have madrasas with, uh, which are offering computer sciences, which have science laboratories and so on. Madrasas have been and possibly even continue to be a poor man's, a poor Muslim's uh, recourse for education. Because in my village, for example, uh, Madrasa gives you the uh, three hours. When you go back into history of Islam, uh, Islam 
uh, if they, they, the European uh, uh, historians have gone on record to say that Islam brought Renaissance in Europe. And, and the so-called madrasas in the early part of 8th or 9th or 10th or 12th century, they, they were started as, as a universities and colleges, uh, uh, right from Baghdad to, to Cordova. Uh, and even today, uh, when you see the academic gowns, in India today, uh, the Islamic clergy wear that gown uh, when leading the prayer or something. So that was the Islam gave the world academic gown. Uh, Islam gave the world the sense of inquiry, sense of, sense of research, science, technology. The scenario changed radically after the coming of freedom. There were already larger institutions started in the 19th century, like the Aligarh Muslim University, or the Jamia Millia Islamia started in the 1920s for higher education in Delhi, for the benefit of the elite. With freedom, the canvas of education changed fast and high schools and intermediate education started spreading out into the districts. Muslims started sending their sons and daughters for higher education and once knowing that their traditional education would provide no answer for their future well-being, the Muslims changed over to adapting to new demands. The large madrasas like Darul Uloom Dioband and Nadvatul Ulema in Lucknow also started revising their curricula. They took to modern education while retaining the classical methodology. Now, computerization has come to these institutions in a big way. There is always a case for modernizing any system of education, uh, whether it is a part sala, whether it bias with, uh, with Hindu uh, education or madrasa. They need to be modernized. They have to have input of modern education, input of modern science. In fact, you may be aware that the government, present government in the Pradesh and also even government, has given uh, quite a few dozens of uh, Urdu uh, computers. Uh, to these madrasas and uh, in UP and other parts of the country. Our concepts of moder modernity and what is considered modern and to see it through the eyes of Islam, I think, and that it becomes a crunch in a sense at, at, at a philosophical um, uh, uh, level. There's, there's a crunch factor involved because the perceptions of what we perceive as modernity and what is modernity. I think modernity is a state of mind. What is your worldview? Is it narrow? Is it restricted? Or can you come back to Elan and grace? And I think that is the crisis. And you did have it. The point is, all you want to see is the, uh, the Moors in Spain. All you want to see is the music in India, your, your, the, the Sufi tradition. You know? And you've got to see Omar Khayyam and Ibn Battuta and uh, Abni Sena and botany and astronomy and mathematics and algebra. Now you link it all up. Wow, it's all there, and in mathematics, in, in, the, in the decimal system, in the, in the zero, in the, in the astronomy, in, in navigation, it was all there. Now you've got to see it with its grace, rather than this restrictive vision, and to recognize the fact that times change, there are people's aspirations to recognize that, and to come to terms with it, with grace. But what has been more striking is the advancement in science and new technology. We can take the example at present of President uh, Abdul Kalam. He gave a new site for the missile technology. And in the same way, Dr. Zahur Qasim, he, he uh, uh, went to the Antarctica and he hosted the flag, Indian flag there. And uh, Dr. Owais Siddiqui, he was the former president of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And he was honored with one of the most prestigious awards, uh, that is National Award for Science Academy by the US. It is next to uh, this uh, uh, Nobel uh, Prize. And uh, moreover, uh, the Nobel laureate Abdul Kalam, Abdul Salam, who says himself as a Pakistani, but he is basically trained in India. So we can say also that if we get the opportunity, if we Muslim get the opportunity, we can prove ourselves as a good scientist and as a good technologist. In the civil services examination, bright students have made their mark even if the number of those 
seeking administrative jobs among Muslims has not been according to the ratio of their population. Yet, one comes across a Muslim topper in both civil services and technological examinations. A big leap forward from the forlorn days of the partition. In the armed forces, the Muslims have made their names at different rungs. Brigadier M. Usman, the hero of Noshera, who fell to enemy bullets in 1948. Many young Muslim officers and men made the supreme sacrifice during the Kargil War. This tradition in the realm of armed forces is traceable to the days of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose's Indian National Army in which Shah Nawaz, Dillon and Segal made a famous trio. In the field of industry, Azim Premji of Wipro is India's richest man, while Sipla of Vaike Hamid is not only a farmer major, but is engaged in fighting AIDS and is a partner of the Clinton Foundation. In the brassware and other industries, the Muslims have earned both prosperity and fame. M.F. Hussain and S.H. Sayyid are legends in the world of painting. It is no mean achievement that India has had three Muslim presidents, high-profile and popular central ministers, as well as chief ministers and governors in several states. The first Muslim president, Dr. Zakir Hussain, was an eminent educationist who was close to Gandhiji and Nehru. The next was a grassroots Congress leader, Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed, the present president, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, has been India's missile man and a scientist of the highest caliber. In Bollywood, Yusuf Khan, popularly known as Dilip Kumar, blazed a new trail which made him tragedy king and is now a member of the Rajya Sabha. Later, the great Khans made their debut. Shah Rukh Khan, Amir Khan, Salman Khan. They were preceded by Feroz Khan, director, actor and producer in his own right. His brother Sanjay Khan made his name with the tele serial The Sword of Tipu Sultan and Jai Hanuman. I think uh, the, the Indian cinema is a symbol of secularism. And it is a symbol, why it became a symbol? It's being seen by, by the people of the country and that consists of so many people belong, belonging to different faiths. When they go and see the film, they go and see the star and the actor performing over there. They don't go in the theater that this fellow belongs to our religion and we will see his film. As you know, that Mr. Dilip Kumar, who's a Muslim, he's been considered by every Indian, whether he's a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or a Sikh, as a great actor. He has contributed a lot uh, to the Indian cinema. He brought uh, greater prestige, uh, uh, you know, for, for India, from abroad also. And through his performances, I think every Indian respects him. You know, all the tops are today the Muslims in India. And it's a pride for us. If you look at the prominent people who have um, made a mark for themselves, people who uh, immediately come to my mind are people like uh, Rafi Saab, you know, in the singing, then there is K. Asif, Mehboob Saab, then there is Dilip Saab, then there is Noshad Saab in music, then there are, you know, I might be missing a few here and there, but you know, when you look at the current lot, you see, you see the likes of Salman, Amir, Shah Rukh, and then the younger ones like Saif Ali Khan who are making an impact. And uh, you have A.R. Rahman in your music, you've got Anu Malik. So, you know, these are the kind of people who probably immediately come to your mind who have made an impact in the film industry. And, uh, you know, they're very, they're, they're, they're contributors, you know. Practically in the writing field, I suppose, in the lyrics department, they have made a lot of contribution. We have uh, enormously huge names in that, like Sahib Ludhyanvi, Majru Sultanpuri, Kafi Azmi, uh, who have made contributions to, to, to this thing. Construction industry, we are in Bombay, Lokanwala is the biggest name. He's a Muslim. Rijvi is the biggest name. He's a Muslim. So, Kam to Milta, Kam Chalte Retai. Azim Premji 
is an ideal example of the Muslim contribution and quest to come into the mainstream and belong. Like this, for example, there's another gentleman in South India, in Vanambadi. He quotes the leather price of the world each morning. The Muslim Zardozi workers, they export is worth about 40,000 crores. So you can imagine how much contribution they are making to the exchequer by way of foreign exchange earning. The partition came as a calamity for both Muslims and Hindus on either side of the border. And Muslims, in a sense, had to start from the very scratch. Yet patience paid, and thanks to Providence, they are now equal partners in the national mainstream, playing their roles in different walks of life.